Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I've looked at about 100 and, I think it's 178 different studies, and they're in a variety of different areas. Um, psychology, neuroscience, education, and I've tried to piece together what is the science, if there be any, behind some of the very popular fears and mistrusts about digital technology. This is a very important thing for me as well, because I understand and I do empathize with the concerns that um, parents often feel about this new world that our children find themselves in, completely immersed, heading towards a 24-7 technology world. One of the things that we hear is that our love of the latest technology could be turning into a 21st century addiction, that Facebook is infantilizing our brains, turning us into little children, unable to communicate properly, and that Google is degrading our intelligence. Well, I'm going to start off with the first claim that search engines and the ability to access and use the internet is actually taking something away from us in neural terms. And one of the studies, one of the very few studies, actually scientific studies, that has fed this um, idea was carried out by Gary Small and colleagues. And what Gary did was to ask a set of participants, some of which were naive users of the internet that hardly ever used it, and another group that were actually quite experienced at using it, to use a search engine and also to read a book. And he compared which regions of the brain were more active when using the internet compared with reading a book. And what we can see is that for naive users, there was some increase in activity in occipital regions, occipital temporal regions, but for the experienced users, those people who spent quite a few years Googling, we see a completely different picture. We see lots of different regions of activity. It would appear that experience with Google, experience with a search engine, has changed these people's brains. This is probably just about learning. Whenever we learn, there are changes that occur in our brains. The brain is plastic. And what we're seeing here is a study of learning where adults have practiced difficult multiplication tasks. On the left picture, we see where brain activity has decreased. And those regions tend to be associated with working memory. It's our ability to hold things in our attention. And we use working memory a lot when we're first learning to do something. We have to remember what we've been told. We have to remember the mistakes we made last time, not to listen to our distracting colleague next to us or whatever. All these things place a burden on our working memory. But when we've actually practiced our task and we have learned, then that load on the working memory decreases. And instead, we have increase in activity in more posterior regions, what we can see in the right image, which corresponds to regions associated with automaticity. So there's a shift in activity from frontal to posterior regions for this particular type of learning. But actually, you know, there's no one place in the brain where we learn. These changes can occur in different ways for all different types of learning tasks. But learning is always associated with changes in the brain, changes in the connections between neurons, and quite often these sorts of shifts in regional activity. So when we go back to these images now, we may see them in a different way. What we have here are people in the right image who have learned to use Google. They are probably using the search engine in a different way. These experienced users are probably using more search strategies. They have different types of targets, a set of targets, more complex decision-making processes are in order. So yes, using the internet rewires our brains. Should we be concerned? No, I don't think so. All of experience, when it becomes a learning experience, rewires our brains to some extent. Now, I said that the brain is plastic, but I have to admit that some brains are more plastic than others. And children's brains are more plastic than adults. 
But in this world where these children with their more plastic brains are immersed in this digital world, this wasn't my childhood. And it's right for us to be asking questions because these individuals are more sensitive to these new environments. And research in the 1990s showed, for example, that greater internet use was linked to reduced social connectedness and well-being. That might be of concern. The more time you spend on the internet, according to this research, the more socially isolated you are, the more likelihood is that you will suffer from poor psychosocial well-being. And maybe this is behind some of these concerns that Facebook is somehow infantilizing us and holding back our social development. And yet, we have to ask ourselves, what was a digital teenager in the 1990s like? What were they actually doing? I'm talking about text-only websites. I'm talking about floppy disks that were big and that were really floppy. So perhaps it's not surprising that teenagers who were very committed to this type of quite remote um, experience were also you know, more connected with social issues. In other words, the more time that children spent on the internet in those years was connected with more of these social problems. But also, many of their friends were not on the internet. Very few teenagers were actually connected back in the 1990s. So this was not a matter of using the internet to support their existing social network. Now we find the research is telling us very clearly that social network sites generally stimulate teenage social connectedness and psychosocial well-being. If you are using social network sites and you're a teenager, you're more likely to have a healthier social life and you're more likely to be happier as a person. That's what the research is telling us. Now, I'm not pretending that there aren't issues involved with social network sites. Cyberbullying and certain types of abuse do occur. However, they seem to be linked usually to issues that are beyond the technology itself. In other words, if somebody is prone to being uh, bullied on the internet, it is quite likely they're also being bullied in the classroom. It suggests that children need to be protected from these things using the same skills of awareness and avoidance as they would use in their offline world. But it is also, and this is a big caveat, how the technology is being used. Because yes, social network sites are connected to positive social outcomes, provided they're being used to support existing friendships. Teenagers who are using it to make a lot of new friends that they haven't had before, people that they haven't met before face to face, that um, is usually connected to a whole set of other issues which can be negative. That is not the normal way that it is being used. So we keep coming back to this idea of is the internet bad for us? If we can go back to fire, the most ancient of our technologies, we know it's good for many things. It's good for warmth, it's good for toasting muffins and doing our cooking. I mean, it's very bad, though, if you use it carelessly. We don't see panicky headlines saying fire may destroy us because we've come to understand the dangers and the precautions. And we are beginning to understand those about digital technology as well. And a lot of it does derive um, from common sense. Chiefly, it's about how we use the technology, not about the technology itself. Technology itself is neither good nor bad. It's how we use it, when we use it, how much we use it, what for. Different types of technology are likely to affect your sleep patterns in different ways. And perhaps you should be aware that small bright screens have been linked to a delay in melatonin secretion. So in fact, they are more likely to disrupt your sleep than, for example, television screens. And there is some evidence to suggest that this is a problem, particularly amongst teenagers. Teens who text after lights out are four times more likely to suffer from daytime sleepiness. And there is also the issue that disturbed sleep will not just disturb the amount of energy you have and how sleepy you feel the next day. Sleep is very important for consolidating memory. And here you can see the images above where the activity during wakeful hours preceding sleep are actually being reproduced in the brain during sleep as part of this consolidation process. If you interrupt sleep, you are likely to interrupt learning. We know the internet, as well as if it's used wrongly, it can cause um, problems. It can also heal problems. And a review of 22 studies of computerized cognitive behavioral therapy recently concluded that this was an effective, acceptable, and practical healthcare option, particularly for those who otherwise would remain untreated, and especially when it was delivered via the internet. 
And the internet can also teach. I mean, apart from the myriad of resources that schools are now using, it also allows you to communicate in a way that has never been before possible. It's also, of course, about how much you use it. There has been often hypothesized a link between too much internet use and a lack of exercise, which of course is great concern to us in these days of obesity. But actually the data, when you look at the research, is very mixed on this. There are some studies that do show a negative effect. The more you use the internet, the less exercise you take. And there are also studies that actually show the opposite. For some reason, the more internet use you're, you're indulging in, the more exercise you're taking. And I think um, a study by Atwell actually provides some insight into this because it's about whether it's disrupting your day-to-day -day normal routines. That is the point at which internet use becomes problematic. And Atwell found that if it was no more than eight, power, eight hours per week, there was really no impact on exercise at all. And of course, we're not talking about here, I don't think we're talking about internet at school or internet for homework, we're talking about leisure time internet. So I seem to be saying that in almost all respects, there's no evidence of digital technology's special influence on the brain. To a large extent, this is true. I think that well-being in our new digitized environment is really about transferring a lot of our offline, everyday wisdom into this new world. Choosing activities with obvious benefit, moderating um, and making sure we have a, vari a variety of activities. And for children, it's been suggested by the Academy, um, the American Academy of Pediatricians, that two hours of entertainment screen time, that's TV plus entertainment on the internet, video games, whatever, is a sensible um, maximum time for children per day. Scientists have found at least one way in which we can improve our basic cognitive function. I mean, this is a very attractive idea. All of our education and our performance in our work relies upon us using basic cognitive functions like attention, memory. If we could train those, then you can imagine knock-on effects in all sorts of different ways. We could train those primary basic functions. And in terms of working memory, scientists are beginning to achieve this. And this is quite exciting. I mean, for example, the task on the left, people are being presented with a different visual stimulus every few seconds. And every now and then, they're being stopped and they're being asked, is this the same as two back? And if they get it right, then it will probably become more difficult. Next time, they might be asked three back. But if you train people to do this half an hour a day, and we're talking about young adults, then not only does it improve their working memory ability, but it also improves their fluid intelligence, their ability to apply what they know to new situations. Fluid intelligence is the best predictor we have of academic and professional performance. However, in all other respects, brain training has been something of a disaster. Scientists all over the world have been struggling in their basement labs trying to find ways of doing this. <clears throat> the journals are full of, of myriads of papers of efforts that have failed. It appears that other types of cognitive or brain training, if you want to call it, do not transfer to new tasks. So they get better at what you're practicing, but actually it doesn't transfer to anything else, certainly not to the real world. Meanwhile, in lounges, front rooms and bedrooms all over the world, thanks to a particular type of technology, young people and many adults have been experiencing increased performance on many visual motor tasks, ones that require um, visual decisions, visual attention and response times, switching of their visual attention from one thing to the next, improvements in their ability to suppress distracting visual influences, an improvement in their ability to infer an action's probable outcome in a very short period of time. What is this thing, this type of technology that has been bringing about these improvements? Action video games. It appears that just 10 hours of play for non-gamers, people who wouldn't normally touch the things, can generate transferable benefits to other tasks. Longitudinal studies have been able to track improvements in these skills in relation to gameplay. And there haven't been many studies undertaken, but these effects even transfer to some professional activities. The Israeli Defense Force now insist that their trainee pilots indulge in action video games. And we recently heard from military spokesmen from the US saying that their best drone pilots were those who indulge in action video games. What is going on inside?